Good afternoon and welcome to our TV show featuring documentaries revealing the realities behind myths using research and scholarship. I'm your host Ergun Kurukovalu and I will be with you every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're welcome to send me your feedback at www.mythsandrealities.com. There's a wonderful quote by General Dwight Eisenhower about fairness. It was published in, in the March 24th, 1947 issue of Life magazine. I quote, though force can, be, can protect in emergency, only justice, fairness, consideration, and cooperation can finally lead men to the dawn of eternal peace, unquote. I concur and ask for your fairness in considering what I have to say, as I know your cooperation will follow, leading the Turks and Armenians to a civilized dialogue and reasoned debate on just memory and mutual suffering, leading to a shared narrative, justice and peace. Let me start by reminding all that Turks and Armenians have lived in relatively peaceful cohabitation for seven centuries. The dispute we recently hear so much about refers to the events of the last 160 years. So what happened that destroyed the peace of many centuries between Turks and Armenians? World-renowned historian Professor Justin McCarthy in his testimony of March 15, 1996 at the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on International Relations gives us a glimpse. I only change the word deportation to relocation to stay loyal to the definition of each term. I quote, actions of the Russian Empire precipitated the conflict. In 1800, Armenians were scattered within and beyond a region that now encom encompasses Armenia, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Eastern Turkey. In all but small districts, Armenians were a minority, which had been under Muslim, primarily Turkish rule for 700 years. The Russian Empire had begun the imperial conquests of the Muslim lands south of the Caucasus Mountains. One of their main weapons was the transfer of populations, relocation. They ruthlessly expelled whole Muslim populations, replacing them with Christians whom they felt would be loyal to a Christian government. Armenians were a major instrument of this policy. Like others in the Middle East, the primary loyalty of Armenians was religious. Many Armenians resented being under Muslim rule, and they were drawn to a Christian state and to offer of free land, land which had been seized from Turks and other Muslims. A major population exchange began. In Erevan province, today the Armenian Republic, a Turkish majority was replaced by Armenians. In other regions, such as coastal Georgia, Circassia, and Crimea, other Christian groups were brought in to replace expelled Muslims. There was massive Muslim mortality. In some cases, up to one-third of the Muslims died. The Russians expelled 1.3 million Muslims from 1827 to 1878. One result of this migration, serving the purposes of the Russians, was the development of ethnic hatred and ethnic conflict between Armenians and Muslims. Evicted Muslims, who had seen their families die in the Russian wars, felt animosity toward Armenians. Armenians who hated Muslim rule looked to the Russians as liberators. Armenians cooperated with Russian invaders of eastern Anatolia in wars in 1828, 1854, and 1877. When the Russians retreated, Armenians feared Muslim retaliation and fled. 
hatred grew on both sides, unquote. The condition was worsened by rebellions of Armenian revolutionaries, which, according to the Armenian historian Louis Nalbandian, started in Zeytun in 1862. Numerous armed secessionist groups, which would be called terrorists in today's parlance, were established between 1862 and 1890. Some among them were the Union of Salvation, the Black Cross Society, Protectors of the Fatherland, Armenakan, the Hunchakian Party, Revolutionary Party, and the Armenia Revolutionary Federation, also known as the Dashnaks. Now let's go back to Professor McCarthy's congressional testimony of 1996. I quote, The situation was exacerbated in the 1890s, in which cities in eastern Anatolia were seized and many Muslims and Armenians were killed. Intercommunal warfare between Turks and Armenians in Azerbaijan during the Russian Revolution of 1905 added to the people's distrust of each other. Muslims and Armenians were now divided into sides, antagonists. Each group believed that in a war they would be killed if they didn't kill first, a classic self-fulfilling prophecy. Most Muslims and most Armenians had no wish to be part of this, but they were caught in the awful consequences of their expectations and their history." Unquote. According to page 34 of the Macmillan Dictionary of the First World War, written by Stephen Pope and Elizabeth Ann Wheel, published in London in 1997, I quote, Armenian nationalist movement had blossomed since the turn of the 20th century. Armed and encouraged by the Russian and several minor coup, were repressed by the Young Turk government before 1914. Denied the right to a national congress in October 1914, moderate Armenian politicians fled to Bulgaria, but extreme nationalists crossed the border to form a rebel division with Russian equipment. It invaded in December and slaughtered an estimated 120,000 non-Armenians while the Turkish army was preoccupied with mobilization and the Caucasian Front offensive towards Sarakamish." Unquote. McCarthy continued, I quote, Armenian revolutionaries, many trained in Russia, attempted to seize main Ottoman cities in eastern Anatolia. They took the city of Van and held it until Russia in, uh, Russian invaders arrived, killing all but a few of the Muslims of the city and surrounding villages. In the countryside, Muslim tribes, tribesmen killed the Armenians who fell into their hands. Armenian and Kurdish bands killed throughout the East, and massacre was the rule of the time. Russian and Ottoman regular troops were less murderous, but they too gave little quarter to those viewed as the enemy. Some of the worst civilian deaths of Turks and Armenians came at the end of the war. The killing went on until 1920. Many more died of starvation and disease than from bullets." Unquote. The results were among the worst seen in warfare. In the province of Van, for example, 60% of, of the Muslims were lost by war's end. During the war, each side engaged in de facto relocations of the other. When the Russians and Armenians triumphed, all the Muslims were exiled, as were all the Armenians when the Ottomans triumphed. The Ottoman government also organized an official relocation of Armenians in areas under their control. The relocations were not acts of one-sided genocide on the part of either Turks or Armenians." Unquote. It is important to note that when the Ottoman Empire was under a vicious attack to Dardanelles, 
by the most powerful armada of the time, a joint British, French, Australian, and New Zealander naval force, and fighting for its survival, the Ottoman Armenians in the East, instead of coming to the rescue of their state, chose to take arms against it and even joined the invading Russian enemy armies. If those Armenians stayed loyal to their country, the temporary res resettlement order of May 31st, 1915, or Tereset for short, would not be needed or issued, and the history would develop in a totally different direction. Incessant Armenian armed rebellions, unspeakable Armenian atrocities, victimizing Muslims, and brutal attacks of Armenian terrorism left the Ottoman government no choice but to temporarily resettle Armenians of the war zone to out-of-war zone areas of the Ottoman Empire until after the war. Now, back to the McCarthy congressional testimony, and I quote, it is the Muslim actions against Armenians that have been called genocide, an accusation that is primarily based on counting only the Armenian dead, not the Muslim dead. I do not believe the Ottoman government ever intended a genocide of Armenians. This conclusion is based on both evidence and logic. Of the masses of secret relocation orders seen today, not one orders murder. Instead, they order Ottoman officials to protect deported Armenians. It has been argued that the Ottomans must have sent out another set of secret orders contradicting the first set of secret orders, which were a subterfuge. This assumes that the Ottomans deliberately confused their own officials in wartime so that future historians would be fooled, a more than unlikely proposition. Large Armenian populations, such as those of Istanbul, and other major cities remained throughout the war. These were areas where Ottoman power was greatest and genocide would have been easiest. To decide whether genocide was intended, it is instructive to compare this to the Nazi genocide of the Jews. The Jews of Berlin were killed. Their synagogues were defiled. The Armenians of Istanbul, on the other hand, lived throughout the war their churches open. Another telling argument against genocide is that hundreds of thousands of Armenians survived relocation to the Arab world. If genocide were intended, it must be believed that the Ottomans could not manage to kill them, even though these Armenians were completely under Ottoman control for three years. This is not believable. Unquote. In the regions where Ottoman control was weakest, columns of Armenian refugees suffered most. Since most able-bodied Turkish men were conscripted to the armies and sent to far-flung fronts to defend the country, there were not enough government guards to protect the columns. Sometimes several guards would be tasked with protecting columns of hundreds of Armenians. Here is what McCarthy said on those columns. I quote, When the columns were attacked by tribesmen or bandits, Armenians were robbed and killed. It must be remembered that these tribes were those who had themselves suffered greatly at the hands of Armenians and Russians. Were the Ottomans guilty? They were guilty of not properly protecting their citizens. Given the situation of the time, though, with Turks and Kurds fighting for their lives against Russians and Armenians, this is understandable, although it is never excusable for a government not to protect its people. Conditions are best illustrated in the Van Pro province where Muslim mortality was the greatest. 
the central government ordered the one governor to send gendarmes, rural policemen, to guard columns of Armenian deportees. He responded that he had 40 gendarmes at his disposal. All the others were fighting at the Russian front. The 40 gendarmes were protecting Muslim villages against Armenian attacks. He refused to let the Muslims be killed by Armenians so that Armenians could be protected from Muslims. While Ottoman weakness should be censored, should we not also ask how well Armenians and Russians protected the Turks and Kurds who fell under their control? The answer is that in provinces such as Van, where intercommunal fighting was fiercest, Muslims who could not escape from Armenian bands were killed. Virtually, the entire Muslim population of southeast and far eastern Anatolia either became refugees or died." Unquote. In all fairness, when we grieve the suffering of the relocated Armenians, shouldn't we also grieve for the suffering of the murdered or exiled Muslims of Van who experienced an even higher rate of mortality? What historical questions about the Turkish-Armenian conflict can be answered by politicians raising their hands in state or federal assemblies or foreign parliaments? What do they know about history? Why does the US Congress vote to condemn one side in the conflict and try to legislate history scholarship? Professor McCarthy's congressional testimony continues and I quote, one reason is that we have all been conditioned to expect a world of heroes and villains or victims and villains. This feeling has sometimes caused Americans to misinterpret events, particularly in the Middle East. However, it is the Holocaust of the Jews that most deeply and proper, properly affected us. Our remembrance of the evils of Nazi Germany has unfortunately caused us to see other events of history through the glass of the Holocaust. In the Holocaust, an innocent people were persecuted and annihilated. There was no Jewish threat to the German state, yet the full force of a modern state was mobilized to slaughter the innocent. We naturally think of the Holocaust when we evaluate other examples of inhumanity. But no event in history can compare to the Holocaust. Indeed, in history, most loss of civilian life has taken place in wars in which both sides were armed, both sides fought, and both sides were victims. World War I in Anatolia was such a war. Assuming one-sided evil has led to an unfortunate approach to the history of the Armenians and Turks. Instead of investigating the history of the time without prejudice, all the guilt has been attached to one side. Once the Turks were assumed to be guilty, the search was on to find proof. The process has been one of assertion and refutation. It was asserted that Talat Pasha, the Ottoman interior minister, had written telegrams ordering the murder of Armenians, but these proved to be forgeries. It was asserted that statistics, supposedly from the Armenian Patriarchate, proved that Armenians were a majority in, East, in Eastern Anatolia. But these statistics were found to have been created without reference to any actual records by a writer in Paris. It was asserted that letters published during World War I by the British Propaganda Office showed Turkish guilt, but these have proven to have been sent by missionaries and Armenian revolutionaries, both of whom were less than neutral sources. 
it was asserted that courts martialed by a post-war Turkish government proved that Turks had engaged in genocide, although careful examination of the records shows that the charges were included among long list of crimes brought by a government under control of the British occupiers, lists that included all sorts of actions that were demonstrably false and included anything that would please the conquerors. The problem with these assertions is that the accusations have been given wide distribution while the refutations have been generally known only to historians. For example, so few have seen actual population statistics that it is commonly believed that Armenians were a majority in what is still erroneously called Armenia. Even though Muslims outnumbered Armenians, three to one. The British propaganda descriptions of Armenian deaths, all of them from anonymous sources, has often been reprinted with no mention that the Armenian revolutionary parties were the source. Nor is it mentioned that historians have proven that the British propagandists routinely invented their evidence. Those who speak of supposed evidence from the period when the British occupied Istanbul neglect to mention that the British themselves, who had complete control over the Ottoman official records, were forced at the time to admit that they, they could find no evidence of an organized genocide against Armenians. There is no time in this short statement to consider all the effects of prejudice and the power of ethnic groups in America. It can simply be said that few wish to consider anything but anti-Turkish statements. The Turks themselves, busy for decades with reconstruction of a war-torn country, long paid little attention to what was being said of them in America. Only recently have studies questioning conventional beliefs begun to appear. Generations of Americans had been raised with one set of beliefs and those who have brought up opposing views have been vilified their arguments unconsidered." Unquote. For those of us who believe that the Holocaust took place as there is a legal verdict by a competent tribunal after due process to support it, it is unfortunate that some genocide scholars today still viciously attack any scholarly reconsideration of Armenian-Turkish conflict in ways other than the orthodox Armenian official narrative, despite perfectly reliable and verifiable evidence refuting Armenian claims. Some academics have been intimidated and harassed to drop their studies challenging the long discredited Armenian claims of genocide. McCarthy ends his congressional testimonial with this, I quote, the historical questions are too involved for easy answers or quick condemnations. History should be determined by the normal procedures of historians. We should write our books and engage in debates until we gradually come to accepted conclusions. Turkish scholars, Armenian scholars, and those of us who are neither Turks or Armenians should not feel that Congress has decided that the issue is revolved, a result, I'm sorry, when we know that this is not the case. Such action can only hinder real investigation of the historical question. There's a very real threat to scholarship when one group of scholars must face the awful and undeserved title of genocide deniers when they do their proper work. There's a statement on the Turkish-Armenian conflict 
that Congress can justifiably pass, but it is a general humanitarian statement. The lesson to be learned from the World War I experience, or the Turks and Armenians, is not that one group was evil, one good. The lesson is that good people, whatever their ethnic group or religion, can be driven by events, their environment, and their history to do evil because they believe they have no choice. The events of World War I should be honored and mourned as a human, not ethnic tragedy. If the Congress is to make a statement on the events of World War I, I would hope it would be a statement of pity for all those who suffered that terrible history." Unquote. This is part one of the history of Turkish Armenians. We will continue our reasoned and civilized discussion in our next episode. Thank you for joining me. See you next week.